liturgy is on servanthood. O oh Lord our God, your wisdom and power are beyond our comprehension, yet our hearts know you intimately. You are the one we turn to when we hear your invitation to be your disciples, when we feel the call to servanthood. It is by faith in you that we respond to your call to serve. We believe that you are our source of love and provide resources for love. We believe that you need not only our lives, but also our actions, so that our small human offerings are not the only results. We believe that it was spirit that empowers us to be all that you created us to be in your world. Yet the call to serve can at times be overwhelming. The need before us is more than one person can handle alone. Lord, many people in our community show your love through their actions. Lord, many people in our church generously offer their lives to your service. stand if you're able. Lord, we thank you for these people whom you have joined together for your purpose. We thank you for the people who live what they believe and believe what they live. We thank you for the spirit that empowers us to be all that you created us to be. We thank you for the spirit of Christ who dwells in such people in our church and community. By your grace, Lord, we stand among those who will hear you say, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. Sick and you cared for me. In prison and you visited me. And you will assure us, Lord, with your words, just as you have done it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me.
offering our gifts to God. Blessing. O God, the source of all wisdom and truth, you are the giver of blessings. You offer wholeness in this broken world. You offer well being to each and every person. You offer the holy work of sharing your good news through all we see and do. May we receive what you offer in gratitude and awe. May we then share what you so freely give so others will know the truth of salvation, your healing. We want to learn from and to serve you is our highest joy. May these offerings and our daily lives spread your message in knowing you and following Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's word for today. For scripture reading, Isaiah 54 to 9a, 4 through 9a. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting because the sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I, therefore have I set my face like flint and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Second scripture reading, James 3, 1 through 12. Responsive reading. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take the 
Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? The reading of the gospel this morning is found in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea, Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Why do people say I am? Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Where do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them, not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give his in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, so this morning, I have the blessing and the privilege to, to expound uh, a text that is very familiar for some of us and is scary for all of us, maybe. Uh, the title of the sermon will be Learning to Bite Our Tongue. And I have to, I'm very grateful because the people that I, I'm always eating out, okay, since I was a shoeshine boy, 11, age 11 in Puerto Rico. So I always make friends with the people at CVS, the people at Dunkin' Donuts, the people everywhere, whatever, on Highland Boulevard, usually. So I have to thank the, the girl, young lady from CVS in the counter, that she gave me the introduction for the sermon. That's nice. Said, oh, yeah, Rebecca, thank you. You gave me the introduction for the sermon. Learning to bite our tongue. How did this come about, this introduction? Well, I was, I was, I was buying my stuff. I showed Rebecca a book, a book about uh, speech and communication. It says, when to learn how to speak and when to shut up. Okay, very interesting title. So immediately that I showed her the book, uh, she goes, you know what? That brings me back to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, they would tell me, a stake and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt me. And she said to me, you know what? That's a lie. That's a lie, child. That is a lie. I think she's correct. It's a lie. Words are powerful. The book of James written by uh, according to tradition, was written by a brother of Jesus named James. 
And this James, uh, in the beginning of his life, growing up with Jesus, was not a believer in Jesus. He could not believe in. So he was a skeptic. But as uh, time went on, and Jesus died, and then Jesus rose again, this James was able to meet him more personally and grow more personally in his faith to such a point that he became a church leader in Jerusalem with a Jewish congregation in Jerusalem. He also became a bishop and he ends up writing this letter. But the way he died was an interesting story. And as I was telling Todd this morning, there's like about two versions about his death. He was martyred at age 94. According to the historian Josephus, he was stoned to death. Josephus was a historian, a Jewish historian, not a Christian historian, but he wrote for the record that this such James, brother of Jesus, was stoned to death. But there is another church leader in 150, between 150 and 230, if I'm not mistaken, in Rome, Clement of Rome, who was uh, later on a pastor of uh, origin, who was one of the big early church father theologians, uh, Clement writes that what happened in the death of James was that he was taken to the top part of the temple and from the peripet, peripet which is a, an architectural term, from the top there, he was thrown, thrown and there he was being weighted by people with clubs and he was clubbed to death. Age 94, martyr for the cause of Christ. So the writings that we have is not written by somebody that lived on Fifth Avenue or lived on a, the Hilton. Someone that went through different stages of faith until he became a believer to such a point that he became a martyr for the Lord. And here in this uh, book, in the epistle, which is kind of a, a, a epistle that is not as personal, a epistle that people uh, categorize them as the general epistles, epistles that are universal because they do not really go into a specific church. He's only writing to churches that are dispersed. Jewish congregations, uh, because the Jewish people were kicked out, uh, the ones that got uh, converted to Christianity or what they used to call back then in the first century, the way, and so therefore they were got expelled, they got kicked out, and they were dispersed all over the Roman Empire. So this letter went to different places. And he wrote this letter uh, with an ethical, ethical point of view. He was very into ethics. How should a believer, a Christian believer, live his life in his context and in his culture? I'm going to tell you a secret. Martin Luther didn't like this epistle. Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw. Why? Because he felt that this epistle emphasized so much the works, the works of the believer. And since Martin Luther emphasized the grace of God, the grace of God working in the believer, he felt that this gave too much credit, too much emphasis on the human volition to do God's will. So he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He called it the epistle of straw. What you do with straw, you burn it down. You, you, it's not as important. Just in case. I had to pay a lot of money for that, okay? Just in case. <laughs> it's seminary. But it was interesting. James, when he writes in this exhortation, he first of all starts with the teachers. Todd, he starts with the teachers. <laughs> he starts with me. He starts with anybody that's a teacher in the church. Because teachers have a role. Teachers have a very important role. What they say, how they say it, when they say it, it's very important. I still communicate with my Sunday school teacher. When I was 18, right now he's about going to 80. I still communicate. I'm going to meet him in Staten Island, October the 19th. Hopefully, with God's will, right? Like James says, with God's will. With God willing, I will meet him in October 19th for a breakfast at a forest, forest diner. Forest Avenue diner. I know my cousin Juan that knows where that is. It's right next to the Rehoboth. Pentecostal church that we used to attend when we were teenagers. So it's a privilege to be influenced by teachers. And James says, teachers who are aspiring teachers need to know that you will be judged more sternly. You will have a higher standard because of what you're doing. Teachers in the church ministry was very important. 
according to Ephesians chapter 3 or chapter 4, uh, Apostle Paul talks about different ministries in the church. The apostolic ministry, the pastoral ministry, the teaching ministry, the, evangel the evangelist ministry, so, and the prophetic ministry. So Paul talks about teaching also, and it includes, and Paul, you know, was a teacher. He, what he learned from the, at the feet of Gamaliel, who was one of the top known uh, rabbis of his time in Judaism, but then as he became converted to Christianity and followed Jesus, he also became a teacher, especially to the Gentiles. So when James talks about teaching, he specifically now mentions a certain part of our bodies that is very important. Everybody knows that uh, most of us have a, a clicker in our, in our house that we could control. Uh, sometimes we could control the air condition or we could control the TV, right? So when he, uh, James talks about the tongue, he says that's a controlling, that's a controlling agent in your body. That's a controlling agent in your personhood. And then he compares it to the rudder in a ship or he compares it to the bridle or the bit in a horse because each of those instruments are, are used to control. And depending on how you use that control, at whatever moment, you're either gonna go this direction or that direction, right? It's very interesting that he uses the analogy of a ship and a, and a horse. Those are travel. Those are traveling uh, instruments. That's how you transport yourself. But you know what? If you're gonna go far in this world, you have to know how you control your tongue. I've heard stories of, the, of a mom that tells a ch child, because you have a big mouth, you should have. As a matter of fact, there was a proverb, Proverbs 17, that says it's best to keep silent because people will think that a silent man is wise. A silent man is wise. The tongue, an instrument of control. It could control your career. Some people don't get ahead. Promotions, why? Talk too much. Think out loud. How many of us think out loud? I thought out loud. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> I wonder if they're gonna give me this or that. Because I'm thinking out loud. I said something, I blurted out something that all of a sudden is going on. And when, when Paul, it, it, not, not Paul, James, talks about the tongue, he then compares the tongue as a fire and as something that sets up fires. He not only uses a simile, but he also uses a metaphor. It's like a fire. As a matter of fact, it is a fire. It sets up fires. It sets up fires. You think with a little fire, you could burn a forest? Go to California. The question of the moment, who is setting up those fires? Is it nature? Is it a human hand? Is it, is it what? But you know what happens, right? As, it, as the fire goes and extends itself, it starts spreading and spreading and spreading. It starts little and it becomes really large, really large. The fire that is set up because of our tongues, because sooner or later we will discover that sometimes we'll say something either at church or in our family system or in our workplace that you set up a fire. And it's not immediate like that. It's little, it's like little crinkles. I was no Boy Scout, but I learned with, with Boy Scouts that were training how to set up a fire and this and that. And there are some people that with their speech are intentional and systematic. They do it on purpose. They're gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something so that this committee will break down and they will not have a vote. They will have to table the motion. I mean, I have, I have to confess, I'm an American Baptist where they say that there's three, Amer three Baptists and there's four opinions, okay? So there's always going to be a conflict, a tension, a, an exchange of ideas, and a clash of personalities even. And then somebody has the gift, and it's not a gift of the spirit, to say something 
to light a match. Somebody sometimes donates the match. Here, I have the match because I know you like to do it. What is it it's called? Pyromaniacs? Pyromaniacs for Christ. Pyromaniacs to destroy the work of the church, to be an obstacle in the work of the church, to not be able to advance the work of the church because of the thing that you said, when you said it, and somebody's going to take it personal. I'm not saying that this happens here. Of course not. We're in a, living in a different planet. But James reminds everybody, you know what? We have to be careful. We don't want to light up the forest. You know what happens when, when a person gets burned? I know literally what, what could happen to a person getting burned. Because when I was in Nyack College, my, uh, bio, my, our biology professor had an accident where his son got burned like 95% of his body. And they made a movie and a book on it. It's called The Joel Story. His father was Professor Sonnenberg. He was, I think he was Norwegian. He was going to Boston, apparently, for a trip, whatever, vacation trip. And they got hit by a truck from the back, if I'm not mistaken. It hit the gas tank and the baby was in the back. That happened. I pray to the Lord that that child is still alive because I know he became an adult and, and they, they, you know, as I said, wrote a book, uh, made a film, Christian film stuff, uh, regarding their resilience, regarding their faith, regarding their test of faith. They were burnt. From a spiritual standpoint, people get burnt. First degree, second degree, third degree. From a spiritual standpoint, church, people get burned. After 40 years of being a pastor since 1992 in Washington, D.C., I've seen how people get burnt in the church because of a comment, because of a careless remark, because of a condemning judgmental way, whatever it is. And I grew up in a church when I was a child where everything was a sin. And there was a judgment jury out there saying, oh, he's got too long hair. Oh, no, he's not spiritual enough. Oh, no, he's not emotional enough. Oh, no, he's not smart enough. Oh, no, he's not obedient enough. That was stuff I was taking. And my cousin is a witness. <laughs> we grew up. We went to the same Sunday school. She was, small, she, she was younger. I don't want to put her in my bracket now. Younger. She's just teaching each other for me. But you know what? Along my way, journey as pastor and minister, I'm finding myself with people that I knew for years, decades, 30, 40, 50 years, and, and they say, no, no, I don't go to church anymore. No, 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 I don't believe in God anymore. No, I'm a, I'm a skeptic. No, I'm, I'm agnostic. No, I, I, I don't mention to me anything about church. Because what the deacons did to me, what the pastor did to me, what the so-and-so did to me, what, whatever, walking wounded. There's a lot of people that if you do a survey, why didn't you go to church? <laughs> they say, you want to know? <laughs> you know what the priest said, did in my parish? You know what the pastor did in my school, in my church school? He said this to me. He called me out. He shamed me in the public. He called me a big, 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 horrible label name because of this or that. So it's serious when James talks about it sets up fires. It burns the forest down. And he calls them, when he writes, he calls them a terms of endearment. He calls them Adelphos. Adelphos means brethren, brothers. And we got to be inclusive, brothers and sisters. Adelphos. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Adelphos, Adelphi. James was very concerned in the church harmony, church unity, and he felt that one of the ways the Christian believer has to grow is by learning how to speak to one another. We need to learn how to speak one another. I know we're in New York City. I know that we people in a rush. I know we people we have 10 million things in our agenda. I know that in church, sometimes you got to do, I got to ring the bell, we got to open the door, we got to clean the floor, we got to do this, we got to put the bulletins. But we have to calm down. And we have to take control of the clicker, our tongue. 
what are we going to do with our tongue? What kinds of words are going to come forth from our, from, our, from our mouths? Sometimes people do not go out with you because they feel that your tongue is too dangerous. Sometimes people will say, oh, okay, we eat lunch with that. No, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm okay. I was listening to a, a, an interview, television interview. Uh, they were interviewing Pastor Bernard. Pastor Bernard is one of the most prominent black preachers in New York City. Very prominent. Blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he was saying on his television program, he said, listen, one time a member of my church was very intense, very, very gung-ho on taking me out to lunch. And he said, Pastor, I'll take you anywhere. I'll take you to, you know, the guy had money. He said, I could take you anywhere. What, what do you want to eat? Peter Luger's? Uh, what do you want to eat? Mimi's in the east side? Uh, what do you want to eat? Tabernacle Green? What do you want to eat? Uh, Francis Tavern? Wh what do you want to eat? And the pastor said, he kept on getting the invitation, calling, texting, messaging to his secretary. The pastor said, I'm going to go out with this fellow. He's not mature enough. And in the interview, he said, listen, I'm not going to go out with somebody that then all of a sudden I have to measure everything I say, how I sit, how I, how I take the plate, how I take the fork, how I cough, how I do. Uh -uh, I don't need that. I don't need that stress. So you know what? There are some people that don't even go to church because they don't need this stress. Why? Because somebody's going to make a comment? Why? Because somebody's going to make a remark about how you dressed up or how early you came or how late you came? We gotta be careful. We gotta be cautious. We have to learn how to keep or when to keep silent. We all think our heads are computers. Sometimes we think so fast or we think so, so, so many streams of thoughts that even without acknowledging it, we could be disrespectful from a cultural standpoint, from a female, male standpoint, from all kinds of standpoints. Sometimes we, we overjudge somebody. Oh, you're so late. Did you ask me why? Because <laughs> I, just, I just had a whole bunch of situations going on. Our speech is very important. And the crux of the matter is on verse 9. The crux of the matter is on verse 9. Of course, on verse 7, James said, listen, just in case, human beings, humanity, have been able to master the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, the animals of the land. But guess what? From my memory, from my logic, we haven't been able to tame our tongue. It's kind of a helpless situation. It's kind of a hopeless situation. We cannot do it. It's, it's very hard to do. We discovered America. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to do when we communicate with our grandkids, when we communicate to our brothers and sisters in our church. It's very hard to do when we talk and communicate with our bosses, if we still have bosses. Whatever it is, our neighbors, the person on the street, the person, the vendor, the whomever it is. It's very difficult to like self-control, bite your tongue. How do I do this? The way you do it, doing it. It's hard. It's hard, but you can do it. Let's try. Let's try little by baby steps, like a movie that we talked about baby steps. Let's do the little baby steps. Because otherwise, we'll be insulting one another, free for all. And then we ask, why does the church does not grow? Why does our denomination does not grow? No, it's not because of agendas. Relationships relationships and as I finalize the sermon verse 9 is the crux of the matter because this is how James puts it he's tremendous he's tremendous he's very concrete theologian ethical oriented and James the bishop he says this with our mouths with our tongue we can bless the Lord but then curse our brothers what's up with that with our mouths, we can bless the Lord, but with our tongue, we curse our brothers. 
And then James is very theological here. And he says, you know that our brothers, your brother was created in the Imago Dei. Your brother and sister are created in the image of God. Imago Dei. How do you swallow that? How do you process that concept of us, all of us, created in the Imago Dei? Male and female, Genesis 1, 26 and verse 27. How do we swallow that? How can you berate your son because of his life choice or her life choice? Oh, because I know people have been rejected and said, oh, you, be, you, want, you want to become a missionary doctor? You got to be crazy. You're an idiot for doing that. I remember I, I heard that story live in Illinois at a retreat during the December moment in 1981 that a kid from North Carolina he said to his parents, listen, I want to be study doctor. Yes, I want to go to Duke University. Yes, I want to do uh, North Carolina. I want to go to great medical school, but I want to be a missionary doctor. And the dad said, really? Are you crazy? Are you, I'm not going to give you one red cent, one red dime. And we prayed in that circle. I prayed that he became the doctor the Lord called him to be. We are surrounded by many people that sometimes say, I worship the Lord, I praise the Lord, I adore the Lord, I serve the Lord, and yet curse, swear at. What did Jesus say in the, Old in the, in the New Testament, in one of the Gospels? Do not call your brother Raka. Do not call your brother Raka. If you don't know what the word Raka is, we're going to have to Google it. Because right now, I don't remember the meaning of it, but it meant something that was a rejecting of your brother. And Jesus himself said, do not do that. You can never say to somebody, oh, you will never be a pastor because you're this or that. Or you will never become an engineer because you're this or that. Or you can never become a church leader because you're this or that. Really? Really? No, it's better to keep silent. And, 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 and pretend you're wise than to say something. Because we have to remember, our words can light a fire. You remember Smokey the Bear? I'm finishing up now. Remember Smokey the Bear? Was he an expert on what? Prevention of fires, right? Not the fire, right? He was not pyromaniac. What would Smokey the Bear tell you this morning? Hallelujah. You know, my Dunkin' Donut guy from India told me the same thing. He told me the same thing this morning because I said, listen, my, my conclusion is going to be what Smokey the Bear told people about fires. And he said just exactly what you said. And I said, Lord, confirming only you, only we can prevent fires in our church, our denomination, and in our world. The Lord add a blessing to his word. Amen. Amen. As we, yes. As we think about our people that are, names are in our list, 
in our bulletins and those names that we have in our hearts of people that need our prayers. Um, we pray for so many things going on, our personal family issues, career choices, our valleys of indecisions, our depressions and our anxieties, and all the concerns in the world, especially about the politics and the ideology that runs all over the country. We pray that the Lord will give us stillness of heart. Like Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am still God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are the architect of the universe. And as James says, you are our Lord and you are our Father. And you've created us in your image and your likeness. All male and female, you've created us according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Lord, we confess that sometimes we've, we've sinned against you by what we say to one another or what even we say to ourselves because we sometimes denigrate ourselves, humiliate ourselves. But we also pray forgiveness for that and also pray for our world that is indeed suffering, that is indeed walking like zombies, that is indeed struggling uh, in a world of so much despair, so much angst, so much betrayal, treason, so much hurt. I ask, Lord, that those who have been hurt by the church or hurt by me, may you forgive us and may you help us learn better ways to communicate, better ways not to lit or light up a fire, but instead kindle a glow of warmth and kindness, gentleness, and generosity toward one another. I pray, Lord, that you will touch the hearts of the leaders of the nations, that you bring them to a better understanding of what the Imago Dei means, so that they will stop building so many bombs and so, many st so much stuff that only provides nihilism and provides despair in our world. Help our church to be a light in the world. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand if, we are, if you are able. Singing, Be Thou My Vision. as we depart from your sanctuary, may, may you, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be with us, accompany us as you guard our mouths, as you bless our lips, make them holy so that we can always be able to pray that make our words acceptable unto you and our meditations of our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. <laughs>